Um, joining us on the phone this morning to talk about the possible security threat of COVID-19 and what it means after we have phased out some protocols uh, that were put in place. Professor Emmanuel Kwesi Enin is a director, Faculty of Academic Affairs and Research at the Kofi Annan International Peacekeeping Training Center. And uh, we'll be talking about all this and more. Good morning, sir. Hello? Hello? Good morning, sir. Thank you for joining us on COVID-19 360. Well, it's a great pleasure. And, um, well, I hope you're doing well. First question I would want to ask you, even though we're talking security at this point, basically, what is your assessment of COVID-19 management here in Ghana? Well, I mean, I cannot speak about the health side. Yes. Um, but all I can say is that, I mean, in terms of, you know, the public response, public education, mm. um, I think over time, we are beginning to see a certain improved awareness. So precisely because this is an unseen challenge, an unseen enemy, and we don't see people having COVID and dying in terms of the way their physical appearance looks like, it's been fairly difficult for people to, to grasp mm. the seriousness of the problem. But I think over time, uh, as I travel around Ghana, you see many more people using face masks. The social distancing or physical distancing is still a problem. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think we need to couch the public education in a language and a manner that appeals to multiple segments of our population. Okay. Uh, yeah. Uh, the first couple of months, uh, messaging was a little too abstract, a little elitist. Mm. Uh, people just thought, look, this is an Accra, Kumasi, urban area business and not mine. But as the public education and information uh, continues, people are beginning to change their attitudes. But we need to, we need to continue. Absolutely, we need to continue. And uh, well, now let's narrow it down to the issue of it being a security threat because that was the notion out there at the beginning of the pandemic, the first time that we recorded in Ghana on the 12th of March. We're made to believe that it could cause some security problems. And as a result, borders were closed. Uh, we had security personnel dispatched out there to ensure that people adhered to the lockdown protocols, people were wearing their nose masks and all of that. There's been a phase in, uh, you know, a phase ease, easing of restrictions across board in the country. And so one would wonder, is it no more a national security threat? Well, I think it is not just a national security threat. It is an existential threat. Mm. Um, the initial marshalling of security forces uh, onto the streets of Ghana uh, were basically to help people adhere to the protocols. I think it was very difficult, as we discussed earlier, for people to grasp in terms of their daily activities. Mm. But what is this monster that we are talking about? Yeah. Let's not forget that for the security services themselves, no security service on earth has been trained to deal with, with this thing. Mm -hmm. You know, so for the put up a very brave face to tell us to physically distance and to wear a nose mask and, you know, to wash our hands. They themselves were struggling to deal with this themselves because there were no protocols around it. You know, so this was an important by a high-risk national assessment, mm. you know, that needed two strategies. One, operation from the general public mm -hmm. and from and from among them themselves as a unified institution, and then adherence. Let's not forget that, you know, this is about a state yeah. issuing instructions for a lockdown. Citizens, citizen state relations over time have been very contentious. Mm. You know, so the role of the uniformed forces was simply to say, guys, look, this is what you need to do. Yeah. And that is why I think both the armed forces and the Ghana Police Service and all the sister institutions have done very well under these extremely difficult circumstances. Let's not forget, we also competing demands on their time. Mm -hmm. And if there's 
time we will talk about the borders and yeah. extremism. Absolutely. You know, so there were all these competing demands. They had to do their routine jobs, you know, catching criminals, cyber criminals, people who are jumping over red lights, you know, but at the same time saying that, look, there's this unseen enemy. You've got to distance, you've got to stay in your house, mm -hmm. someone will try to get you some food, you know, and it is this ability to negotiate these competing demands that I will argue that particularly the Ghana police service, mm -hmm. customs, immigration, backed by the armed forces, you know, have done a young man's job. Okay. You know, when, when the original instructions came, the, mm -hmm. the presidential directive, yeah. the Ghana police service's first response was that this is a humanitarian operation. We are not out going out there to brutalize, to intimidate, to yeah. threaten, although there were quite a few disturbing cases, yeah. you know. Uh, but that was as a result of two things. First, the individual fear of the officer of contracting the disease. But secondly, also, the lack of appropriate skill sets of becoming the provider of humanitarian aid, an mm. educator, a comforter, um, a guide. You know, so all these demands, yeah. of course, resulted in some officers losing their temper mm -hmm. uh, and then behaving in ways that we could have done without. You know, but we should also recognize the abuse, the okay. attacks, the okay. intimidation, yeah. and there were way too many people having exemptions. Mm. Everybody was suddenly a big man or a big woman but, who had an exemption and had to go back into somewhere. Mm -hmm. You know? Yeah. And of course, to be generated frustration. Mm -hmm. If we are getting a dangerous machine under control, who is the one issuing all these exemptions? Yeah. Mm. Okay. So knowing how institutions where they have stood their grounds, mm -hmm. some of them have been punished before, then they have to let people go. Yeah. You know, but overall, overall, I think particularly the Ghana Police Service um, has, has done a human's job. Okay. And my hope and prayer is that they will take the lessons of their public engagement because of COVID-19 and use it to change some of their operational uh, methodologies. All right. We'll come to the issue of security personnel and how they have even conducted themselves quite recently during the compilation of voters' register. But let's now talk about the border closure and the fact that there are quite a number of stranded Ghanaians who are crying for help, saying that they cannot afford the quarantine fees. Some may not even be able to afford to buy a ticket and, you know, pay for quarantine as well. And they've been refused entry into the country. I mean, really, if we're easing some of these restrictions to the extent that we even have people uh, totally ignoring the social distancing protocols in public transport, can we not open the borders for people to come home? Could that be a security threat if they should come in? Well, I think the closure of the borders from where I sit mm -hmm. It's a much bigger issue than just opening it for Ghanaians to come in. Okay. I don't know from customs and immigration how many tens of thousands of passengers use the Kutika airport on a daily basis. Yeah. Um, not talking about all our land and sea borders. Mm. Now, we also know that in almost every country where the lockdown protocols were, what is the word I'm looking for? Uh, what? Were, implemented were or lifted? lifted? Okay, lifted. We are seeing an increase. Mm. Now, knowing the resource constraints that we face, I think it makes a lot of practical and operational sense. Mm to keep the borders closed for some time. Let's not forget that it's also costing us massively economically. You know, but on balance, 
allowing X number of thousands, tens of thousands of people to cross the border into into the country on a weekly basis. Mm -hmm. I think we will also have a certain percentage of those who are entering, either being positive already yeah. and then coming to worsen the community spread. Mm -hmm. Now, what are the challenges and the weaknesses of getting these stranded Ghanaians to come home? You know, part of the problem is that where the government to say, look, we are going to bond you, sign this document, yeah. and then we will bring you home and you will pay. Mm -hmm. I can assure you the levels of compliance will be very low. Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. So there is a history to all this. Um, but over time, we will need to find a way of bringing people back home because their visas would have expired. That means they will never be able to go back probably for five years. Mm -hmm. uh, people went for medical treatment. People went to school. Uh, so there are, there are considerable humanitarian reasons yeah. uh, to consider bringing people back home. Okay. And I think extended family friends should probably help. I think the burden on government in responding to the challenges, the unintended challenges of oh. this unexpected COVID-19. Okay. Um, All right. uh, probably if we can help reduce that burden by our friends, family, acquaintances, helping to pay to bring people All right. that could also be useful. All right. Rob, let's talk about fake news and misinformation and how that also poses as a threat. Yesterday, there was a video that went viral of a doctor from Texas who was indicating that she had a cure for COVID-19, which was a drug that we've all known, um, you know, but of course was rejected by some health professionals as not the cure for COVID-19. And eventually, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram put out a statement saying that they were going to take down those videos. And indeed... They did. However, it's still circulating on WhatsApp, especially here in Ghana. Is this not the time for government to step in as they are fighting against fake news to clamp down on these videos? And if that's the case, what is your assessment of what has happened so far and what governments can do to further strengthen its fight against misinformation? Well, I think there are a couple of uh, good points in your question mm. um, about the potential impact of fake information or fake news on social destabilization. Now, if you remember, since the inception of the lockdown, mm. even in Ghana, we have had a lot of fake news uh, videos circulating around police brutality, military brutality. Yeah. And some of these were as old as for five years. And you wonder, what was the essence of someone deliberately going out there to look for an old video and to place it in the public domain at a time when people feel insecure, mm. people feel afraid, and people are uncertain as to the person that they've just said hello to, the extent who that person might infect them. Yeah. Now, they said, I had argued very strongly that there was a need for us to establish a special desk that scans the websites and, you know, whatever, mm -hmm. where people could very quickly report incidences of fake videos and fake news so we can get a robust mm. actual representation of the news. Now, this video that is circulating now, it's, I mean, there have been multiple um, bits of information that shows yeah. that probably we shouldn't place much emphasis on this video. Mm -hmm. So the fact that it's circulating and there is no response of some sort from those who know yeah. uh, is what, for me, worries me and not about the video itself. Okay. Because since the beginning of first time in memorial, the use of false information, fake news, which earlier on, you know, when I was a young man, was called propaganda. Mm. You know, has always been... 
the normal aspect of political security life. Yeah. Okay. So we as the state must know how to respond in a timely, rigorous, and factual manner. Okay. So after the good news, they will keep circulating. Mm -hmm. The question is, what is our response mechanism? Yeah. How fast can we be able to respond? Okay. Um, so. I think this failure is more from our side than the ability of the video itself to circulate, partially mm. because people are desperate for a cure. And if somebody out there works in lyrical about having this cure, then people would want to you know, send it around. So exactly. I hope by this interview and this conversation that you are having with different people, Probably by the close of the day, there will be some response of sort. But I think we need a response. A Absolutely. Response. Absolutely. Uh, uh, Professor Kwesienin, thank you so much for speaking to us. This is all time will allow, unfortunately. But we hope we can connect with you another time to speak about other issues concerning security threats in the country. And Professor Emmanuel Kwesienin is the Director of Faculty uh, uh, of Academic Affairs and Research at the Kofi Annan International Peacekeeping Training Center.